What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football, and we continue on in running back week. So we're going to get into my rankings. My top 25 running back rankings broken down by tier. We did the wide receiver rankings by tier last week, so if you missed that, I will link it here. I will link it down in the description. Highly recommend you check it out because I know a lot of y'all are drafting and you need some good rankings outside of that bullshit they're bringing to you at ESPN. Make sure you don't print out those rankings and draft based on those things. Draft based on the analysis I give you. Nah, for real though, uh, don't use those cheat sheets that you get from ESPN as an actual ranking thing. But we're going to do the running back rankings broken down by tier today. I want to know, are there any guys that you absolutely love compared to ADP? Are there any guys that you absolutely hate compared to where they're being picked? Do you have rankings that are very, very, very different from some of the consensus rankings? I like to hear people that are thinking outside of the box and reasons that they don't like or they do like certain players. So do me that solid, head down below, drop a comment. I wanna know which players that you have ranked very differently from, from most people. So drop that comment down below while you're down there. Please give the video a thumbs up. Worked very hard on this one, as I always try to bring you the best possible content I can. Uh, I would appreciate that thumbs up button, and of course, it gets me a little more exposure on the YouTubes. And if you're watching uh, or if you're listening via podcast, also welcome. Uh, I know you can't see my ugly face, but a rating and review at the end of this bad boy, if you found some value from it, would be greatly, greatly appreciated. But that's all the intro we need here. Let's get into the video. Okay, so the first tier, as many people probably have this um, similarly ranked as myself, we have the top four running backs. We have Lev Bell, David Johnson, Zeke, Todd Gurley in that order. Um, and I basically, in my video last week where I said best draft spot where I would most be comfortable drafting would be the number four pick because I want a top running back and I have them all in the same tier. So I would be perfectly happy with any of them as my draft pick in the first round. Now, I do have Le'Veon Bell as my number one overall ranked player. Now, it's because his workload has been consistent year over year, and it's been consistently massive. Now, all my rankings are based on half-point PPR, um, and Bell is unbelievably involved in both the pass and the rush game for the Steelers offense, who, once again, in 2018, projects to be a super high-powered offense. They have the number four ranked offensive line per pro football focus entering 2018. I know pe some people are worried about Todd Haley leaving as the offensive coordinator. Uh, I wouldn't be. The OC that's taking over has been the quarterback coach of the previous eight seasons in Pittsburgh, so I highly doubt that the offense is going to change. Uh, and that being said, they're actually talking about running more hurry-up plays. I know that was a problem for Big... There was a rift between Big Ben and Todd Haley last year. It was because he wanted to call more plays at the line and he wanted to be more involved in what was going on in the offense. Todd Haley didn't want that to happen. Now there are rumors that they're going to run a lot more hurry-up, which maybe won't be that great for efficiency. I, th I still think it will be, but if anything, there's going to be more volume. A lot of the hurry-up stuff is dump-offs to running backs and things like that. So I think, if anything, this is actually an upgrade for Levy on... Bell, uh, for people concerned about him missing training camp, like, I'm not concerned about it, dude. Like, the year that LaDainian Tomlinson went off for, like, 31 touchdowns, he did not participate in any preseason games. Obviously, Bell's missing training camp, but, dude, he's a vet. He doesn't need to be there for training camp as long as he's staying in shape. And there's been nothing that has been reported or rumored that he is out of shape now. I highly doubt Bell will be out of shape. He never has been in his career. So I'm not worried whatsoever about Bell. He's averaged nearly 26 touches a game over the last four seasons with the Steelers, guys. 26 touches a game. He has also averaged over the last two years, six receptions per game. Do you hear that? Six receptions per game. There are only five players in the entire NFL that have averaged more receptions per game over that span. They are not running backs. They are very good wide receivers, guys like OBJ, guys like Larry Fitzgerald, and guys in that repertoire. So you're really getting a high-end RB1 as well as a wide receiver two, maybe three at worst in Le'Veon Bell. You're getting two players in one position. So Le'Veon Bell, number one player overall. David Johnson, he actually started off the summer as my number four player on the list. I guess I just needed to see him in preseason and remember how goddamn good he was. Uh, it really doesn't matter how bad this offense is going to be. The entire offense is going to run through David Johnson, man. Uh, regardless of the offense overall and regardless of the offensive line 
Uh, if anything, I think that will lead to probably more receptions for David Johnson as a team that might trail a lot or as a team that doesn't want to stand behind their running game. David Johnson is going to get so many damn touches that it doesn't matter what his efficiency is going to be. Remember back to 2016, he almost hit that thousand and thousand rushing receiving. That was his goal. And I think that's very, very possible coming into 2018. So David Johnson is my number two, uh, moving to Zeke at number three. Now, in the beginning of the summer, I actually very, very, very highly debated putting Zeke as my number one overall player, regardless of PPR, half PPR standard. He's fully healthy. He's coming off a campaign where he averaged almost 27 touches a game in the 10 games that he played last year. Zeke is, um, if I had to put a bet down, and he is actually the odds on favorite, but I was thinking about this prior to even seeing the odds, he is definitely a great bet to lead the NFL in both rushing yards as well as rushing attempts. I think his upside is that of DeMarco Murray in 2014-esque, like that type of workload. Uh, DeMarco Murray, if you remember, carried the ball 393 times and caught 57 passes. So that's 450 touches. There is no reason why Zeke can't see that level of um, usage in this Cowboys offense, man. Like, tell me, tell me one reason why he won't see that 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 usage in this offense. I don't, I don't think you can reasonably argue against that. People like to move Zeke down in PPR rankings. They like to say he's not as involved in the passing game. And, you know, for that reason, they like to kind of push him outside top five picks sometimes, you know, if it's full PPR especially. Uh, but over the last two years, right, he has been RB3 in half point PPR, fantasy points per game. So um, even and that's that, that the crazy part is, is that he hasn't even come close to hitting his ceiling in the passing game. You know, we look back at last year, there was tons of reports coming into the season about how he was going to get more involved as a receiver in the year. And that's exactly what happened. Back in 2016, he was averaging 2.6 targets a game, 2.1 receptions per game. In 2017, we saw that 2.6 targets go up to 3.8 targets a game as 2.1 receptions went up to 2.6 receptions per game. Uh, so now you're looking at this offense, which is without Des Bryant, which is without Jason Witten, which is also without Bryce Butler, who's not obviously an impact player in this offense. But there's a very good bet that Zeke becomes way more involved in this offense uh, because they're obviously going to need people to swallow up those targets from the receivers that left. So him increasing from 2016 to 2017, and there are also reports about him being more pass uh, involved in 2018. I actually look at it and say that this is a very high probability that it happened. So if Zeke can get more and more involved in the passing game, his fantasy value goes up so high because he's already so involved in the rushing games. Now, like I said, I was going to put him at number one. The offensive line concerns are very real here. They went from having probably one of the best running offensive lines to pretty much injury, just injury littered, man. So we obviously heard the news of Travis Frederick, their Pro Bowl. He is uh, suffering from a disease. I'm not even going to really get into it. I think it's Gillian Barr syndrome or something. But reports sound that it's uh, say that it's very serious, and there's a good chance that he misses the entire season, which would be a big hit to this offensive line. Uh, you're also dealing with Zach Martin has a knee issue, is a hyperextended knee. Supposedly he should be ready to go for week one, but who knows if that's going to, um, you know, limit him or make him less uh, productive on the football field. Connor Williams, their second round draft pick, who was supposed to be used as depth, but might actually be playing on the line now, has struggled a lot during the preseason, so he has not looked good. He was he was pretty hyped up prospect coming out of Texas, but there's a lot of question marks on the uh, on this offensive line, and that was like the one of the big big things. Obviously, Zeke had working for him, so he moved him down to three. But I think the volume you always chase volume in redraft, and the volume for Zeke is going to be probably higher than almost any running back in the NFL. Moving on to number four, it's Todd Gurley. I absolutely don't hate Todd Gurley whatsoever, um, but he's not going to touch the numbers that he had from last year, in my opinion. And um, regression is coming here. There's no doubt about that. But again, I'd be perfectly happy with him as my RB1. If you wanted to take him first overall, second overall, whatever, I, I'm not going to argue against. Uh, I'm not going to argue against you for that. So we move on to tier number two, and this is one player by himself. It's Saquon Barkley of the New York Giants, number two overall pick. And I'm pretty sure he will be in the top tier come this time next season, uh, but you're not getting the rookie discount on him. I've seen him drop all the way to like 9, 10 in some leagues, and I'd be absolutely ecstatic to get him there. He is the best talent we've seen as a running back prospect in a long, long time, and he has pretty much the same skill set as, uh, as a guy like David Johnson. Uh, we saw in his, in the preseason, right, he he broke off that, that first run. It was a big run. He looked amazing, and I think we're going to see a lot of that stuff. I think he's going to be so heavily involved in this passing game that by the end of the year, he's going to be an absolute PPR monster. Obviously, he's dealing with the hamstring injury, but like I said in yesterday's video, my top running backs to avoid, Barkley was not listed in that video. I was talking about whether or not you should be concerned with the injury. 
I am not concerned whatsoever. Uh, it was a very, very, very minor hamstring injury, and they just wanted to keep it as safe as possible and not play him in the preseason anymore after he tweaked it. Um, I've seen plenty of videos of him so far from from practice and from camp after the injury occurred, and he looks completely fully up to speed. I, I have no doubt he'll be a 100% for the start of the training camp. So, you know, if you're worried about him being a rookie and uh, being unproven, you are doing fantasy football wrong. We've seen plenty of rookies over the last few years dominate um, in fantasy football, and if you're avoiding them, you are probably going to lose your league. So Saquon Barkley is my number five. Ranked running back, tier two by himself. We move on to tier number three, where it's four guys. We have Leonard Fournette of the Jags, Melvin Gordon of the Chargers, Kamara of the Saints, and Christian McCaffrey of the Carolina Panthers. Now, if you've watched my, my videos this year, Fournette is my guy. And after watching him in the preseason and seeing how much they're using him on third downs, I'm even higher on him than I already could be. But he's my number six overall player, so it's not, it's not really possible for me to get any higher on him. Like I've said, the only, 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 only argument you can make against Fournette is his ankle, right? He's had these chronic ankle um, issues that he's dealt with for a, a while now, a couple of years. Um, otherwise, guys, he is locked into arguably the second highest floor workload of a running back behind, probably Zeke. And I think he's a great bet if you want to hedge your bet for uh, leading the league in rushing yards and in carries. Now, the defense is <clears throat> still absolutely fantastic and should give them great field position, could give them plenty of scoring opportunities, will keep them on the field for a long time. He scored 13 touchdowns in 16 games last year. He played in 13 regular season games, um, three playoff games. He scored 13 times last year. He averaged over 25 touches a game in their three playoff games. So you're looking at the important games that the Jags played and you see how important Fournette was in those important games. I think this is so clear what they want to do. Um, they had a good O-line last year, and then they brought in pro bowler left guard Andrew Norwell. And now the reports of him losing 12 to 15 pounds, looking leaner, looking better, more explosive, is, is something that I see. When you're watching the videos of him from camp and when you're watching him in these preseason games, he looks absolutely fantastic. And they're using him on third down. He's getting more third down reps than TJ Yeldon. They're using him in the passing game more, which were the reports all summer. They were saying that they're going to use him in the passing game more. And that's what we're seeing with Leonard Fournette. So I couldn't be higher on Leonard Fournette. I and mean, that's why he's my number six ranked running back. Now we have Melvin Gordon and Kamara. I don't really think there's much to talk about with these two. I think it's business as usual. Gordon uh, actually moved up ahead of Kamara this past week for me. Uh, just seeing how safe of a Gordon, just how safe of a pick Gordon is, or at least it seems to be, because again, there's no such thing, I guess, as a safe pick in fantasy football. But if there was one guy that seems like a safe pick, it is Melvin Gordon. So I think you have to take that into consideration, even if you don't think he has the upside of Kamara. Um, you just look at how Gordon's been used in the preseason, man. Uh, it's coming off back-to-back -back 12 touchdown seasons, which is obviously monstrous for fantasy football and will help you win your league when you're scoring that many touchdowns. And I don't see him being anywhere less involved on the goal line or you know near the end zone. Um, so far this preseason, he has seen 86% of the Chargers' first team snaps. There's no sign that A.E., Austin Eckler, is going to be eating into his workload. And coaches are even talking about uh, Gordon getting more involved in the passing game, which is... Probably a hard to see considering he caught, I think, like 57 passes. But if he does get more involved, geez, Gordon is going to be an issue. So uh, Gordon, like I said, business as usual, high floor. Love him at seventh overall ranked running back. I think he's my seventh overall ranked player too. Now, Kamara, Kamara was uh, you know pretty much the GOAT last year. And the, if I wanted to be basic, the, the analysis here is obviously his efficiency was off the charts. That's going to regress. But the volume is going to progress. Right, and you chased volume in redraft, so um, that's what's going to happen here. That that volume will offset Kamara's efficiency, and you know now that he is without Ingram for the first four games, he will be running behind uh, arguably the best offensive line in the NFL. The only knock on Kamara I've seen is that he's never been a bell cow before, not even going back to college. So it's tough to say how he'll hold up. Will he hold up, or if the Saints are even going to? You know, they're a smart team. They know how to utilize their players. So if they don't think Kamara will be able to last the entire season, if they start giving him 25 touches a game, then they might back up on the, uh, on the usage there. Jonathan Williams is the front runner for the Mark Ingram role over the first four weeks of the season. So I wouldn't be surprised if Williams was getting, you know, somewhere from eight, 10, 12 touches ish. But I think uh, Kamara has only up, uh, up to go in the volume category, I guess you could say. 
And I think uh, I think their strength of schedule in the beginning is so favorable while Ingram is out that Kamara should take advantage of this and really eat. And I think when Ingram comes back, the coaching staff is going to be like Kamara has been so good that we're going to keep utilizing him as our lead back. And we saw going that you know down the stretch last year how much Kamara uh, was being utilized. He was out touching, he was out snapping Kamara. I mean Ingram over the last half of the season in the playoffs, he saw more carries. He saw ten targets to Ingram's two targets. He scored twice compared to Ingram zero. He outgained him like 140 to 65 or something like that. So you already saw the way that this Saints offense was kind of pushing towards Kamara. And I think that's only going to be more evident in 2018. So Kamara is a great pick here. You also look at like this Saints offense. Um, I think Kamara has like 90 catch upside. 90 yeah, around like 90 catch upside, maybe even a little bit higher because the Saints, you know, they want to keep Breeze on his feet. And one way of doing that is by passing to the running backs, getting out of his hands quickly. Last year, they targeted the running backs on 32% of their passes. That is by far and away the highest percentage of any NFL team last year um, by nearly 5%. I think the Pats and the 49ers were 4 or 5% lower than the Saints. So that is pretty much crazy. Um, in a full PPR league, I actually think I would move Kamara back ahead of Gordon and maybe Fournette as well because I think that passing upside is is so big. But um, Kamara, obviously, an another great pick in the first round. And then we have C-Mac, my number nine ranked running back and ending this tier. He is a late riser, um, obviously, just based on what we're seeing this preseason. They are using him as the absolute workhorse, man. The proof is in the pudding. C.J. Anderson just has not created any sort of timeshare that we kind of initially projected when they signed him over from Denver this offseason. This is a quote from Graham Barfield or at fantasyguru.com. Actually, shout out to Graham Barfield. Supposedly, not supposedly, but he tweeted out today that he is moving from Fantasy Guru and more details to come. I'm not sure where he's going, but I'm excited to see wherever he ends up landing because he is one of my favorite fantasy analysts. So stay tuned for that. But this is a quote from him. Christian McCaffrey has been on the field for 28 of 35 first-team snaps, 80%, and handled 83% of running back touches. McCaffrey is the workhorse here. Um, C.J. Anderson finally saw the turf with the ones in the Panthers' second preseason game after McCaffrey ripped off 28 straight first-team snaps. Um, McCaffrey's getting the goal line work, which was a huge concern with Anderson coming into town because Jonathan Stewart in that role has pretty much has pretty much been like a top five, top seven guy in terms of volume on the goal line. So if McCaffrey has that role, if McCaffrey has the goal line role, that's going to be super valuable. And we've seen him have it so far this preseason. So he's getting the goal line work. He's getting the in-between the tackles work. He's getting a ton of targets, as we'd already expect him to get. Uh, he's just getting everything. So he's shaping up to be the workhorse that we saw at Stanford. And that is going to be a huge, huge, huge piece of this offense for Carolina. So you have to, you got to be rising on C-Mac after what we've seen in preseason and the usage. And tier number four. Before we move on to tier number four, guys, if you would like to see all of my rankings, all of my tiers, my top 250 overall rankings, my positional rankings, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, broken down by tiers, just like I'm doing in this video, my top sleepers, my top busts, my must draft players, my Bible, which is an 8,000 word, basically strategy essay on how to attack your league this year. Um, that is all in my draft guide which is available for Perchai right now on BigDogFantasy.com. It includes everything that you would need for your draft. It's basically a one-stop shop for you. You get it on your phone. You can get it on your tablet. You can get it on your laptop. You don't need to print anything out, although it is available to print out via PDF. Um, there are links. There are videos. There are awesome resources in it. So if you need a draft guide for your draft, look no further than BigDogFantasy.com. Head over to the shop section. And it'll be the first product listed. It'll also be linked down below. So make sure you check out the draft guide, guys. Put in a ton of work. It is updated in real time with updates every single week. Shout out to anyone who's bought it thus far. If you have not, make sure you go cop that. And we'll move on to tier numero quattro. Number 10, Devonta Freeman. RB11, Kareem Hunt. RB12, Dalvin Cook. RB13, Jordan Howard of the Chicago Bears. That is tier number four. This tier basically consists of guys with top five upside, but could possibly be stuck in timeshares. Um, so Freeman, the first of the backs listed in this tier, will split work with Tevin Coleman, as he's been doing for the last two years. Uh, but I'd argue he has the safest floor if he plays the full 16 games. If he's healthy, there's no reason why he won't go for 1,300 yards and double-digit touchdowns. That's what he's done in the previous two years. Last year, he was on pace to do so. He only played in 13 games, but had he played in the full 16, his pace would have put him at 1,300 total yards, double-digit touchdowns. He is the clear goal line back there in an offense that I expect to bounce back, and an offense who, on paper, has 
one of the top offensive lines and should score a lot of points. Uh, Devontae Freeman is so heavily involved in the red zone and on the goal line that his touchdown upside is actually, touchdown floor is very, very, very high, I should say. Um, he's just he's just a very big part of their game plan. So Devontae Freeman is someone I'm very happy uh, getting in my, getting as my RB1, if not RB2. That would be great to get him in the second round. Uh, the next two guys, Kareem Hunt and Dalvin Cook. Now, I made the, in, in the Muck Monday video, Say thirsty, my friends. I made the In the Muck Monday video a few weeks ago, if not a few months ago at this point, where I compared Dalvin Cook and Kareem Hunt. And at the end of the video, my conclusion, as I always do, I chose Dalvin Cook as the running back I wanted out of the two. However, following the previous weeks, you know, taking in more content, more blog posts, more podcasts and whatnot, I've actually moved, as you can see, Hunt over Dalvin Cook in my rankings. However, I am lower cons uh, on the consensus of both of these two in my rankings, so it's possible, it's probable, it's actually very probable that I will not end up with either guy on any of my rosters this year. This year. So, you look at both Cook and Hunt, right? And they will certainly be the lead backs in their respective offenses. But I think fantasy drafters are underestimating the roles that the players behind them are going to have. Um, the reason I move Cook back is because I'm more confident that Latavius Murray is going to have a bigger role in this offense um, that people are anticipating and a bigger role than Spencer Ware will have behind Kareem Hunt. Murray will undoubtedly, no doubt in my mind, steal the goal line work from Dalvin Cook. Um, maybe he'll get some carries down there. Maybe he will get involved, but Murray will be the main goal line back there. Spencer Ware... On the other hand, we'll take carries away from Hunt as well. Uh, as we finally, we saw him finally, right? He's coming back off the serious knee injury. He finally returned to game action in their week three preseason game. Uh, he touched the ball five times for 21 yards. Good to see him on the field, right? Um, which tells me that he's ready to roll for week one and he will be involved in this offense. Now, going back to Murray. Murray has scored 20 rushing scores. His 20 rushing touchdowns in the last two years. He is good at scoring. That is a very real thing, regardless of if you think Murray is a good running back in the league, if you think he's efficient, if you think he's good at breaking tackles. He has scored 20 touchdowns over the last two years. On two different teams, coaching staffs understand that this guy is good at getting the ball in the end zone. You can't just write it off. Um, there are even reports that there's going to be a timeshare between Murray and Cook, and I don't really think that's the case. But Murray will be involved on parts of the field where fantasy points are very very valuable, right? These six point touchdowns are, are super valuable when you're a fantasy player. Most NFL teams don't have the luxury of having a backup running back like Latavius Murray. And I don't think, you know, you should not think that they're not going to use that accordingly, bro. Um, you have Cook coming off this injury. Now, I, I think it'll be fine. I don't really factor torn ACLs into my injury, uh, into my player rankings or analysis anymore because players come back, you know, stronger than ever, if not stronger than they were before. And it's not really been a problem for anyone. Um, but if they want to lighten the workload a little bit for Cook, they have the guy in Murray that they could feel comfortable doing so. Um, with Hunt, you're looking at Kansas City, right, with a coach in Andy Reid who normally gives the RB2 in the offense a pretty decent workload. Um, after Ware went down last season, right, Ware went down with the season-ending injury, Reid was forced into giving Hunt uh, the highest percentage of carries any Kansas City back has basically ever seen with Andy Reid there. And this is a chart I used in my In the Muck Monday video. And uh, it's probably difficult for you to see. And if you haven't already seen this, basically what this is is breaking down the last like seven years in the Kansas City offense. It's looking at the total carries and total receptions of running backs on Kansas City. And then it's breaking it down into percentage of those carries and receptions for the RB1 and the RB2. If you look all the way to the right in 2017, uh, that was last year, obviously, with Kareem Hunt breaking out. You see a lot of green and you see a lot of red. That's telling you that these are very strong points. Not saying they're outliers, but they're very strong. You could see that Kareem Hunt had 87% of the team's carries. That is by far and away, you look at the, the previous three years before that, the RB1 had 67% of the carries, 48% of the carries, 57% of the carries. But last year it was up at 87%. No running back is getting 87% of their team's carries. And the reason was obviously because Spencer Ware went down. Spencer Ware would have eaten into those carry numbers. So, Kareem Hunt's 80% RB touch rate, he had 80% of their touches, right, last year, which is the highest number of the last seven years. And going back even further was too, I just didn't have time to chart everything, tells you that his numbers are going to regress in the 
rushing game. He has looked very good in the passing game. We also look at Patrick Mahomes, who has shown that he is a good quarterback, and he is going to make a lot of plays this season. I think the problem was going into the summer, based on ADPs, based on Hunt, Hill, Kelsey, Watkins, where they're all being drafted pretty highly, people automatically assumed that Mahomes was going to be the passer that they wanted him to be, and he was going to be a stud. Now, we've seen him play well. I think he's going to throw a ton of interceptions this year, but he's going to make a ton of plays, and that's obviously good for Hunt, because we know they're going to come out, they're going to be throwing the ball, and Hunt is going to get a lot of passing down work. When it comes down to it, I think Cook and Hunt are both fantastic real life runners, and I think they're both going to have successful years in terms of efficiency, but I'm just more worried about Latavius Murray eating into Cook's workload than I am Spencer Ware eating into Hunt's. So that being said, give me Hunt over Cook slightly, but I probably won't own either guys, to be honest with you. We'll move to the last running back ranked in this tier, and that is Jordan Howard as my RB13. He's had a he, he's a hard guy for me this summer to rank properly. I think he's a, hard, a tough guy for a lot of people to um, to rank properly. But I am finally rising on him, and I'm finally really liking drafting him at his current ADP. Um, he's going in like the third round in a lot of drafts, and I think that's a great, great, great spot to grab him. Look at Matt Nagy coming over from the Chiefs. He was the OC for Kansas City last year. He's coming over and installing this new offense for the Bears. And he has come out and said repeatedly that Howard will play on third downs. He will operate on third downs. And that's the big knock on Howard, right? If you're in any sort of PPR league, it's hard to trust him considering he's got hands like feet, bro. He doesn't catch anything when they throw it his way, uh, and he's just not very involved in the passing game. But Matt Nagy has consistently said over and over again, he's a feature back, he's a third down back, he's a workhorse, we can use him on all three downs, and I think you have to start believing in what Matt Nagy is saying. The same way he told us that Trey Burton's going to occupy the Travis Kelsey role in his offense, right? Travis Kelsey ran 50% of his routes from the slot last year. This offseason, this preseason, Burton's been lined up in the slot on 48% of his routes. So it's lining up with what he's saying. And there are, you know, you have to be able to separate the noise when you hear all these coaching reports and this coach speak. I think Matt Nagy is becoming someone we could trust when he tells us these things. So for him to say that about Jordan Howard is, you know, you have to you have to be excited about it. And then you see the preseason usage, and that's what we're that's what we're seeing. Howard has played on 72% of the snaps for the first team. Cohen has played on just 27.5% of the snaps. They have split third down snaps three to three. That's great news considering, you know, we weren't sure if Jordan Howard really was going to be playing on third downs. Uh, I mean, Cohen's being targeted in the passing game um, and Howard really isn't. So that's something to keep an eye on. But if he's going to be there on third downs and he's going to be playing on all early downs, they're going to eventually start using him in the passing game, which is great. And you look at, you know, uh, just what Howard's done over the last couple of years. He scored 15 rushing touchdowns in his first two years, rookie and sophomore year, in bad offenses. Uh, Nagy's offense has much more upside, of course, and Howard is a good bet to flirt with, you know, double-digit touchdowns. He scored nine rushing touchdowns in last year's offense. So this team, who projects to be better, who projects to be uh, winning more, uh, should put some more positive game script into Howard's lap. So more rushing attempts, probably more rushing scores for him. And uh, over his first two years, he's averaged over 1,200 rushing yards. So I would totally see him dabbling with uh, that number again. And if you're getting someone with 1,200 rushing yard upside, uh, double-digit rushing touchdown upside, and hopefully being more involved in the passing game, you know, his floor is already fantastic just from the rushing side of things. If he does, in fact, get involved in the passing game, you're looking at a guy that has upside of a top five fantasy running back this year. So, you know, I, I just I just really like Howard. If he's going in the third round of your drafts, guys, he is a great play, especially if you end up going wide receiver, wide receiver early. Uh, my fr we I had a live draft this, this last previous weekend, and uh, it was a super flex. So my friend took Antonio Brown with his first pick at like six overall, and a couple, you know, a bunch of running backs went off the board, and then quarterbacks went off the board. So he was able to get Antonio Brown, then OBJ, Third round pick, he got Jordan Howard. So that is like the perfect start. It was only a 10-team league, super flex. So, uh, of course, guys are going to drop a little bit um, compared to 12-team leagues and, and things that are like that. Uh, but that that is such a good start. Antonio Brown, Odell Beckham, Jordan Howard. Like great, great, great start right there. So uh, I really like Howard. He's someone who's moving up my rankings pretty quickly. Move on to tier number five, and we have two guys in here. This is Joe Mixon of the Bengals at RB14, Lamar Miller at RB15 of the Houston Texans. Joe Mixon is another tricky one for me. Um, he, he's someone I was so high on coming into the summer. I pulled back a little bit because I do have to try to be objective with the risk that's involved with Mixon. I absolutely love the guy's talent. Uh, but I have, for some reason, in all of my drafts, I have trouble pulling the trigger in uh, in the third round. 
of drafts, and that's probably around where people have been picking him because I, I've had the second the second pick overall in both of my redraft leagues that I've had so far, and I actually have the second pick in the E Town Get Down draft. And I know a lot of y'all are looking forward to that vlog. The draft is on Monday, so before you guys a ask the question, the E Town Get Down draft is on Monday, so Labor Day Monday. The vlog will be up within two days of, of the uh, of the draft itself. But I have the number two pick in that league, so I'll get the number two, then I'll get the number nineteen and. 21 or whatever. So Mixon will probably be available there at the 21 pick. My problem with Mixon is that there have been some bad indications this summer. I mean, there's been some good and bad. We'll break down both of them. Get the bad stuff out of the way first. So uh, despite reportedly, you know, losing weight and coming in leaner and hopefully being more explosive this, this year, 2018, uh, Mixon has not looked good in the running game so far this preseason. Not like I expected him to look. Not like he looked at Oklahoma, you know, during his collegiate years. So, assuming he doesn't play in week four of preseason, which I highly doubt he will, he'll end the season um, running the ball 13 times for 24 yards. That's like 1.8 yards per carry. Last week, he had just seven yards on six carries. The offensive line, while they did upgrade pieces by drafting Billy Price in the first round, trading for uh, Cordy Glenn, they're still not looking to be great. So that is still very, uh, very much a concern of mine. The good news for Mixon is, though, he has clearly been the work workhorse here, and people were a little bit worried that Gio Bernard would make this a timeshare, and it still might happen over the course of the year, but for right now, he is absolutely the workhorse. Uh, he is significantly out-snapping and out-touching Gio Bernard with the starters. Um, he's being used all over the field as well, which is good. They're putting him out wide. They're putting him in the slot. Um, and he's made a bunch of big plays so far in the receiving game. He finished the, the preseason, uh, three catches, 48 yards, and a touchdown. And he's looked pretty explosive. And he's looked awesome running routes and catching the ball, which has always been a really, really strong point for him and is always why he's had that three-down workhorse, like elite fantasy running back upside because he could play on all three downs. He's a bigger back. Um, so... The comparisons to Le'Veon Bell are very much warranted, but I think they probably need to be pulled back a little bit, right? He had that weak rookie year, then they come in, lose some weight, and are explosive in their second year. Um, but it's possible that Joe Mixon is this year's Todd Gurley, right? Um, people like myself dug too far into who Gurley was as a player from an efficiency standpoint and not looking at the volume that's coming. And in redraft, volume is absolutely king. So. Mixon, if he can really turn around and become the runner that we saw at Oklahoma, then he is in for a monster, monster, monster season because he's going to be heavily involved in the passing game and he's going to see a lot of work and be very productive in that sense. So it comes out to him as a runner. What you believe is him as a runner, I just think the volume is going to be big enough that I could put him at running back 14, followed by running back 15. This is Lamar Miller. Lamar Miller, I'll say this right now, is quickly becoming the single best value at the running back position in 2018 fantasy football drafts. It's not even close. We have Deonta Foreman, who people thought was going to push him for work, which he did last year, but he will not this year because he tore his Achilles and no running back comes back successfully from a torn Achilles. Probably going to start on the pup list, which means Miller will be the all-out featured back, three down back for at least the first six weeks of the season. I don't want to guarantee that because maybe he doesn't make the pup list, but um, he's going to miss time. Miller is entrenched as a three down workhorse. Head coach Bill O'Brien said just as much He's what we call a three-down back in this league. Looking at the snaps this preseason, Deshaun Watson has played 27 snaps this preseason. So you're looking at 27 starter snaps for the Texans. Miller has been in on 26 of 27 snaps. They have no one behind him besides Alfred Blue. The extra medium Alfred Blue is the only running back that they have behind him that would even remotely come close to taking any of the work away from Miller. Now, Miller's another guy who had reports of dropping weight this offseason. Um... Well, I love that. You also need to take that with a grain of salt, but he does look better. I think he looks leaner. I think he looks more explosive. I think he looks like he has better better burst and he has better wiggle. And that's something he has sorely lacked with the Texans over the last couple of years. He's not, he hasn't been very elusive, but to me, he looks better um, from what I've seen in the preseason. So I'm excited to see what Miller can do this year. And, you know, you also look at Deshaun Watson returning fully healthy. Miller was much, much better, put up much better numbers with Deshaun Watson in the lineup than with him out of the lineup. And we will look at some of the splits. And this is, you know, this is not common sense, but this is a theme that we see throughout a lot of running backs when they are paired with a mobile quarterback. Um, because the linebackers are obviously taken out of the play. One of them has to watch Deshaun Watson. So that means the running back is really playing 11 on 10 rather than 11 on 11 with another line, bo line, line in the backs. Linebacker in the box. 
Um, as you can see, the fantasy points, almost like five fantasy points more per game with Watson in the lineup, more rushing attempts, obviously, because they're probably winning more games and all this stuff. So I think it's it's looking very much up for a guy like Lamar Miller in 2018. You should draft Lamar Miller in round four or five of every draft you're in. So we'll move on to tier number six. Before we do so, I want to thank today's sponsor for the video. This is FantasyJocks.com, industry leader in everything your fantasy league needs, whether it's fantasy football, baseball, basketball, it doesn't really matter. They got everything there. Championship belts, championship rings, championship trophies, draft boards for your league. Guys, if you're drafting this weekend, make sure you get your orders in now. They could still get it to you before your draft. They have expedited shipping on the site. They have draft kits starting at like $29.99, comes with the board player stickers. It comes with a yellow flag that you could throw at your friend's head if they're taking too damn long to make their picks. Have everyone chip in five, seven, eight, nine, eleven dollars and get whatever you want on the site. You can use promo code TAKE10. You can use promo code TACO CORP for 10% off your purchase, which will hopefully help you out and incentivize you to make a purchase. But I'm telling you, these things are super, super duper high quality. You can get the champion's name engraved on the belt or on the trophy. The Lombardi trophy is actually sick. I don't have one of those yet, but I think we're going to buy one for the winner um, this year in the E-Town Get Down League. So fantasyjocks.com, I highly, highly, highly recommend you check them out. I wouldn't plug them if I didn't believe in the product, if I didn't believe in the brand. So that will be linked down below. And I hope y'all end up snagging something from there for your league. It's so much better with something on the line, guys. I'm telling you, you will love playing for a belt. It, it is the absolute... Goat. So thank you, fantasyjocks.com. We move on to tier number six. I have three running backs in this tier. Number 16, RB16, Alex Collins. Number 17, LaShawn McCoy. And number 18, Jay Ajayi. People were really concerned with Kenneth Dixon and uh, Buck Allen in the previous game getting all the work. They're like, uh-oh, Alex Collins is no longer like the featured back. This is what you call the clear, unquestioned starter in Baltimore. They're sitting Alex Collins because they don't want to get him hurt. They want to see what they have in a backup running back. They have a competition between Allen and Buck. Or wait, of Dixon and Buck. I apologize. They have a competition between these two, and they want to see who's going to be the one that breaks out. Alex Collins had three rushes the entire preseason. And being the running back that Collins is, the very good runner, um, turned those into a lot. Went three for 33. So three rushes, 33 yards. However, 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 for as good as a back as I think Collins is, and he is one, there's a reason that he is ranked outside of my top 15 running backs. The concern for a running back by committee is very real. Buck Allen, or as I like to call him, Suck Allen, profiles as a shitty but high volume pass catching back in this offense. Um, he might vulture third down work from Collins, which we saw in the first preseason game. They split snaps six to six, and Buck Allen took uh, a lot of the third down work. He also might vulture him on the goal line. We'll have to see what happens, but we knew the Ravens liked to use Suck Allen on the goal line last year, um, which would not be good because as an early down back, one of your upsides is usually you know getting rushing scores, like something with Jordan Howard we would see. But if you don't have that, then you're looking at Early down work, maybe not a lot of pass catching work, and the guy uh, ending up on the bench when they're on the goal line. So we look at Buck Allen as a vulture there, kind of. Um, Kenneth Dixon has actually admittedly looked pretty good this this preseason. And given the amount of shit that Dixon has gone through over the last few years and still maintained a spot on the roster, it tells you that the Ravens so badly want him to be a thing, and they will give him the opportunity to do so. Collins is a favorite, the heavy favorite for early down work, um, but it's it's super tricky to accurately guess what his role is going to be when it comes to third down roles, uh, third down work, when it comes to pass catching work, when it you know comes to this, the two minute drill. Uh, it's really, really hard to say, man. Like Mixon, you know, Collins is a guy I'm not necessarily targeting everywhere, um, but I would love to have a share or two of him because I think the upside is super, super real. So it's not someone like him and Mixon are, are not guys that I want so bad in the third or fourth round. But if they fall a little bit to me, I would be super happy about getting them because I want to own at least a piece of them in uh, one or two of my teams. Because, like I said, I think the talents are very real for both guys, and I think the upside is real. So RB17, we have LaShawn McCoy. He's down here for pretty obvious reasons. One, well, because his offense is going to be horrible, very bad. Uh, they're not going to have a lot of scoring opportunities. Their O-line lost three. Um, three key starters this offseason, and it's just not going to be an offense that moves the ball well. So that is never good for a running back, of course. And number two, we still have no idea what's going on with this whole domestic violence thing. Um, by no means am I saying LaShawn McCoy did it. By no means am I saying he was even remotely involved in it. 
uh, but that does not change the fact that he can be put on the commissioner's exempt list at any point. It does not change the fact that some random piece of evidence might come out on September 16th, and boom, there goes Shady for your entire season. So picking him as like a top 10 running back in the second round or the third round is far, far, far too risky for me. Uh, I could understand maybe if this was like Le'Veon Bell going through this, right? And Bell's a guy with his upside is so damn high to ignore that you can fight through this and you could pick him at his ADP. But a guy like LaShawn McCoy, he's not coming back to a good situation uh, and he's getting old, of course. Like it's, it's just not something I want to risk. His ADP right now is 25th overall. That's way too high for me. Um, his volume will certainly be there if the illegal situation, you know, plays itself out and nothing comes of it. And that, that alone will help him flirt with, you know, top 12, like RB1, high end RB2 numbers. But for right now, it's it's way too risky for me. I don't want to draft someone that's so risky in the top three rounds. So he's my RB17, but he probably won't end up on a lot of my teams. Then we have Jay Ajayi, RB18. And again, another guy where I initially chose Ajayi over Alex Collins in my In the Muck Monday video I did a couple months ago, earlier this summer. But Ajayi is actually hurt right now. He's missed eight or nine straight days of practice with a lower body injury. We don't really have any more details as to what's going on here, but it's concerning. Um, so I'm a little worried about that. He should still be the lead back on early downs, but just like Collins, Ajayi might be in more of an uh, running back by committee than we imagined. Um, Clement is, Corey Clement is his backup and is a guy I really like, and I expect Clement to probably get somewhere from like eight to 10 touches. And I think Ajayi will probably get like 13 to 15 touches a game, but that's not really the upside I look for in a running back that I'm taking in the third or fourth round. I want a guy who will likely, not likely, but you know, has a, has a pretty high probability of being the featured guy in their offense. Um, and I just really, I'm not sure I see that happening too much because they have Clement and they also have Darren Sproles. Um, and I have no idea if Sproles is really going to be involved, but I'm pretty sure they're going to get him involved in, in their weekly game plan. And maybe he's the two minute drill guy and maybe he's involved in the pass catching work. So I think him and Collins are in a very similar situation, but I personally think Collins is more talented. And I'm actually going to check Roto World right now to see if there's any uh, updates on Jay Ajayi. Eagles coach Doug Peterson said Alshon Jeffrey is progressing well, um, but the coach refused to say if the receiver will be ready for week one. It still seems unlikely Jeffrey starts the season on the pup, which would cost him six games, but it remains possible if not if not likely he misses a game or two. Carson Wentz, Eagles coach Doug Peterson expects to make the quarterback decision for week one by Friday. The comment suggests Carson Wentz has just a few days to get cleared for full contact. That's actually interesting because apparently he is not on... Uh, he has not been cleared for contact. So obviously he can't start if he's not cleared for contact. And uh, if he's making the decision by Friday, today is, I'm filming this on Tuesday. You're watching this on Thursday, I believe. So he has like two days to be cleared for contact and I doubt that will happen. So if I had to guess, I don't think Wentz is, uh, I don't think Wentz is going to start week one, which is surprising because the videos that have come out, it's just like, he's looked so good, but I guess the knee might not be all ready to go. Jay Jai, yep, has been sidelined for over a week at Eagles practice. No new updates on that, but it's definitely not a good thing because we have no idea what's going on. So Jay Jai is moving down a little bit in my rankings, so RB18. And we move on to the final tier. This is a tier of seven, six guys. Tier number seven, running back 19, Jarek McKinnon, running back 20, Royce Freeman, running back 21, Kenyon Drake, Rex Burkhead, 22, and then the two Titans running backs, Deion Lewis, 23, Derrick Henry, 24. The further you get down the rankings, obviously, the more question marks come attached to these players. And as I posted on my fantasy football Instagram last week, highly recommend you go follow that Instagram, giving out straight fire value, as I always try to do for y'all. And actually, you know what? At this point, if you feel like I've given you some value from this video, if you've enjoyed the video, because I work very hard on these, so if you have enjoyed so far, uh, would you please just scroll down and give it a thumbs up real quick? It takes two seconds to do that, and it would be highly appreciated by me. So I'm gonna give you like six seconds to do it. I'm a generous guy, so I'll give you three times the amount it actually takes. Awesome, thank you for that thumbs up. I very much appreciate that. Jarek McKinnon, if you follow my fantasy football Instagram, uh, each week I pick a busty Friday pick. Some guy that is a bust, not necessarily a bust, but I don't like him whatsoever at his current ADP. Jarek McKinnon was that guy for me last week. His current ADP right now is 24th overall. That's an easy fade for me at this point. He was someone that I absolutely loved coming into the season. Like this wasn't the case for him just a month ago, but things have changed rapidly as they do in the month of August for football players. Thanks to this calf strain that has sidelined McKinnon since their week one preseason game. Uh, and that will be up until week one of the regular season. 
if he is returned and if he is fully healthy for that game. So a muscle strain in the calf has a high re-injury prob probability, which frightens me. And now they bring in Alfred Morris, who had career years with Kyle Shanahan, right? The head coach of the 49ers right now. Alfred Morris balled out with Kyle Shanahan uh, in Washington a few years ago. In their last preseason game, Alfred Morris looked very good. He carried the ball 17 times for 84 yards. I tell you, bro, he looks like he's still got some sauce left to him. Last year, <clears throat> Alfred Morris was surprisingly very, 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 very good for the Dallas Cowboys in a backup role. He ranked very highly according to uh, pro fo here we go. Football Outsiders, their DVOA for uh, ranking running back efficiency. He was ranked very highly for that. He averaged 4.8 yards per carry, 3.3 yards after contact. So Morris, uh, by no means, is just a schlub in that backfield. It's possible that he carves out an early down role because I think, mo I mean, most of the fantasy success we saw that we projected McKinnon having was probably from the passing game, or that was the upside I saw was that he was going to be so involved in the passing game after seeing what Carlos Hyde did last year. There's absolutely a risk here. He's injured. Matt Breida's also been injured, so Breida could have carved out a, a bigger role had he not been injured as well, so I guess that's kind of a positive for McKinnon, but Morris might low-key make a little bit of a factor here. Uh, reports are saying that they don't expect him to carve into the early down work, but we'll have to see. My concern is more so with the injury and seeing what happens with that. Shanahan, at the end of the day, Shanahan is an absolute wizard at turning backfields into fantasy Magic. Don't forget about the free agency money they paid McKinnon. He's one of the top paid running backs in the league this year. You don't give a guy that kind of money um, and just fade him off because of a, a little calf injury. There is definitely still risk here. I, I still like McKinnon because when he's back, he's going to be the main pass catching back in an offense that throws to their running backs a lot. I mentioned that the Saints threw two running backs on 32% of their targets last year. Actually, I mentioned that in yesterday's video, I believe. But um, only San Francisco, San Francisco was third in terms of target rate to their running backs. It was the Saints, the Patriots, then the 49ers. And you look at those offenses, they're all pretty damn good. They know what they're doing. Kyle Sh Shanahan is ahead of the curve with that stuff, and McKinnon will be heavily involved. Carlos Hyde caught 59 passes last year, and McKinnon, if he plays a full 16 and stays healthy, should murder that. But a price of 24 is a little bit too risky for McKinnon right now. Um, so he'd have to fall probably a full round in terms of ADP for me to get on board with drafting him. The next guy up, running back 20, I believe. It's Royce Freeman. Uh, he's looked as good as basically any rookie running back has this offseason. He scored his third preseason touchdown in as many games uh, this past weekend. It was a beautiful 24-yarder. He kind of burst through the hole. He sh a little shake and bake action. Broke off some arm tacklers on his way to a 24-yard score. Looked very legit. However, and I've been echoing this all offseason, guys, Devontae Booker is a real thing in Denver. I don't give a shit that you don't like Devontae Booker's talent. He has a role in this offense. He has started all of the preseason games, and he has been playing as many, if not more, snaps than Royce Freeman. Uh, Philip Lindsay looks like he is carving out a pass-catching role, possibly. And, you know, the coaches just... They don't just run backup players out there, and they don't start backup players, and they don't have Devontae Booker out snapping Freeman 14-11 to in their preseason games for no reason. Why would you practice a backup guy that much if he's not going to be uh, involved in this offense. So obviously Freeman is more of a long-term play. This will start off as a running back by committee. Um, but as we've seen throughout the preseason, Freeman is a much, 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 much more talented running back than Devontae Booker is. And hopefully that will play itself out. My concern is that it might not. My concern is that they might not give Royce Freeman the 275 carries people want him to get. Um, like I said, Booker had 14 snaps in the last preseason game. Freeman had 11. Philip Lindsay had eight. Booker was also on the field for the two-minute drill. So he's going to be that quick hurry up back for them, as well as carve out a role in this passing game, which is obviously a very valuable part to running backs in fantasy football. So Freeman, of course, has that monster upside. The coaches have talked him up a lot. They think he can be uh, an absolute grinder and, and handle a huge workload like we saw out of him in in, uh, in college at Oregon. I almost think it's like a it's like a poor man's version of Jordan Howard from Freeman. I think Freeman's a better pass catcher, but it's hard to see him have the uh, rushing floor that Howard is going to have. So I'm okay with where he's being picked right now, fourth, fifth round. But if he starts moving up any further, I'm definitely going to be out uh, based on the fact that this is going to be a timeshare at least on the beginning of the season. So. 
Fourth is the earliest I would go. Fifth round is preferable. If he moves into the third round, there's no way I'm taking a shot on Royce Freeman there when there are Jordan Howard and there is a Joe Mixon there available. So Freeman is my RB20. My RB21 is Kenyon Drake. He's also a guy I've wrestled with in terms of my ranking, and I absolutely hate the situation that he's in. Um, it's projected to be a poor offense behind a bad offensive line. Gore is going to get more work than most people expect. Um, but what, we, what we've seen from Drake in the small sample size last season, in preseason so far, is that the upside, the talent is very, very, very real. So the past weekend in a draft, I actually, I drafted Kenyon Drake. To my surprise, I didn't think I would own any shares of him this offseason. He did fall to me in the sixth round. Um, it was only 10 teams. And it was a super flex league, so a lot of quarterbacks were off the board, and it's a smaller league than a lot of people play, like 12-team leagues, of course. But Kenyon Drake in the sixth round, I could not pass that up considering the upside that he has. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I look back and he just disappoints and he's in a timeshare and he doesn't score a lot of touchdowns, but um, I'm happy that I got him there and it was a great value. So I absolutely will not be taking him in the third or fourth round, which is where he's going in a lot of drafts, that's for sure. Um, we have such a small limited sample size from him last year. Uh, and I think the coaches have made it very clear that they don't envision him as a workhorse, that they are bringing other backs in, that he is not the guy they want to give 20 to 25 touches a game, um, at least this year. So he's capable of making plenty of big plays. He's a very good athlete. He's very good at passing, uh, catching the ball out of the backfield. So I think he will make plenty of big plays and he will have big games this year and he'll have his share of fantasy days where, you know, you're obviously happy that you drafted him, but I think there's a lot of risk involved. So that's why he's fallen back to RB21, but uh, I'm really happy I actually got a share of Kenyon Drake, as I was saying with like Joe Mixon or Alex Collins. Like I'm not necessarily targeting them, but I would like to have them based on their upside. So RB22, the back to own in New England, Rex Burkhead. Now he's been sidelined with a knee issue for, for a minute now, a hot minute, um, but he returned to practice last Sunday. He hasn't played in their preseason games, but apparently, as per this report uh, from Jeff Howe of The Athletic, Patriots are being overcautious with Rex Burkhead to preserve him for the regular season. Burkhead resumed practicing on Sunday despite a minor knee tear, but the Patriots aren't going to risk putting him out there during the preseason per how New England views Burkhead as an offensive focal point, particularly with Julian Edelman suspended for the first four games. Evan Silva's favorite player could be a steal at his current seventh round ADP. Um, that's not a surprise that they are going to make him the focal point of this offense because he's a guy who can really do it all. And I expect him to be so involved with Edelman out of the offense for the first month of the season. I expect him to be super involved um, even when Edelman is back. His uh, his current seventh, seventh round price is fantastic, even if you're not a fan of getting involved in the New England backfield because Burkhead, like I said, is someone that New England used everywhere last year. Uh, in the passing game, running the ball in between the tackles, within the 20s, the goal line. As we like to say at Big Dogs, at the HQ, you've got to diversify the revenue. And this is exactly what Burkhead does. I think a lot of the reasons you, you want to avoid a New England running back is because most of them are game script dependence, right? They, they take a certain running back and they say, this is the role you're going to play and that's it. You have the early down grinder, you have the pass catching role. But Burkhead, since he could do all of these things, is the only back that's really not game script dependent at, um, at this point. Uh, he's super flexible in the way that he scores his fantasy points, which means on a week-to-week -week basis, he's a good bet to be involved in that offense, and that is absolutely an offense that you want to have pieces of for fantasy football. Um, you know, And they're just going to be using him all over the field the first month of the season. With Edelman out, I think he'll be used in the slot. I think he'll be used outside. He will be giving carries, possibly the goal line work. We'll have to see there. Um, but I think he's an absolute steal in any sort of PPR league. And we move on to the last two running backs here on the list, and it's the Tennessee Titans duo of Deion Lewis and Derrick Henry. I want this tweet by Graham Barfield to kind of sum it up for you guys perfectly. Uh, I'm going to start with the bottom one. The final count of Titans' first team running back rotation in the 2018 preseason. Deion Lewis, 22 of 40 snaps. Derrick Henry, 19 of 40 snaps. 55 to 48% in, term, in, uh, in favor of Deion Lewis. Third downs. Dean Lewis got eight snaps to Derrick Henry's two snaps. As he said, Henry's touchdown ceiling is huge, but it's going to be a near 50-50 split. Henry has little receiving use, is game script dependent. Lewis will play all three downs, will be on the field when Tennessee is ahead and or behind. This split, like these numbers, the 55 to 48, or just the number of snaps and third down and stuff, couldn't be easier to see coming, guys. They didn't pay Lewis $20 million to have him in a backup Role. Lewis will occupy almost the entirety of the passing game coming out of that backfield, right? And you have Matt LaFleur coming over, who was the OC of the Rams last year. And we saw just how involved Todd Gurley was as a pass catcher out of the backfield. Caught 64 passes on 87 targets for 788 yards, six touchdowns. 
all those numbers, all three of those, all four of those, passes, targets, scores, yards, ranked top five among NFL running backs in 2017. What's more is that the Titans won't have the game script that the Rams did, right? Gurley was that involved in the passing game while the Rams were constantly beating teams. So for that involvement in the passing game for a running back while the game script is usually favored towards rushing the ball more, tells me that Lewis could see even more work. I think like what Gurley had last year is almost like, I don't want to say the floor because those are monster numbers, but those are like, you could almost expect that from Lewis this year. Um, and that is monster, monster numbers for a running back in the, in the passing game. What you're looking at is like, Tennessee is certainly not a bad team by any stretch of the imagination. They won't have games where, they won't normally have games where you go into it and it's like, oh, this is going to be a Derrick Henry game or, oh, this is going to be a Deion Lewis game. Deion Lewis is the one that will play on all three downs. If they get down in a game, Derrick Henry probably won't be utilized that much. So I, I prefer Deion Lewis slightly, but Henry obviously can't be written off, you know, without hesitation here. He's a guy, again, I don't want to draft, but I really hope he actually falls to me somewhere at a really good value because guys, I always like to hedge my bet. Like I said, diversify the revenue. Like a lot of guys on this list, I'm not targeting. I, I, I understand that I will be wrong on some things. There are a lot of things I will project this season that I will be wrong on. It'll make me look bad, but Henry is one of those things that if I am going to be wrong on and he ends up being the opposite of what I think, then it's going to hurt me a lot because Henry has the upside of scoring 10, 12, even like 14 touchdowns this year. And that is going to hurt me, of course. So I'm hoping he falls to me somewhere, but I absolutely will not be reaching for Henry given the fact that Lewis is going to play 50% of the snaps here. I am worried that, you know, it's going to be a nightmare kind of deciding week to week which one of these is going to play. I think Deion Lewis has a safer floor based on the fact that he is not game script dependent. And I think he gives you just a better week to week floor. Um, so those are my top 24 running back guys. My RB1s, my RB2s broken down by tiers, the rankings. Like I said before, if you want to check out all my rankings, if you want to see my rankings by tier, my overall rankings, my top sleepers, my top busts, must draft players, my top resources for fantasy research, all this stuff can be found in my draft guide available now. BigDogsFantasy.com. Just head over to the shop section. This will all be linked below as well. Please give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be doing videos like this all off season, baby. And uh, into the season, of course, weekly videos. I think my breakdown is going to be recap videos uh, on Tuesday, the wide receiver cornerback matchup on Thursday, and maybe like sit start and just Q and A's on Saturday. But I have to get down what my schedule is going to be throughout the week um, during the regular season. But super excited for the season to kick off, guys. I am, oh man, if you're watching this, that means Woo! Since it's Thursday, we're a week away. We're officially a week away from the regular season kicking off. You know, I got my Falcons kicking the kicking the season off, baby, against the Eagles. Hopefully, Carson Wentz sits for Week One. That'd be a nice little, be a nice little turnaround for us. Maybe we can catch that dub out in Philly. But uh, that's gonna be it. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, guys, and I will see y'all tomorrow. Peace.